Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome everyone to our show today. Our topic is going to be stress and burnout, solutions for busy professionals. Today we have the insightful Natalie Feynman, a doctor of veterinary medicine. She's also a certified positive intelligence mastery coach, and she says she's a recovering workaholic. I hope you'll join us as we delve into strategies to combat burnout and find harmony in our professional life. And Natalie assures you'll never dread going to work again. Looking forward to talking to you about that, Natalie. Thank you. She brings a wealth of experience and expertise to guide us through the journey towards a more balanced and fulfilling work life. We've heard much in the news about healthcare providers experience stress and burnout. And in fact, in many walks of life now, it's becoming very common. But one thing Natalie gave me insight into was the stress and burnout that veterinary doctors and their staff face. These are the ones who love our animals as much as we do. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Oh, my, it's, I feel honored to have Aww. you on the show. So thank you for joining me. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your workaholic. You're a recovering workaholic, <laughs> and I'm sure somebody is going, yes, please, please let me know what how you yes. recovered. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of people kind of turn to work as a way of escaping from maybe other areas of their life that aren't working so well for them. Like if you're having kind of a rocky marriage, a lot of people will hide in workaholicness. That wasn't Mm. me. (laughs) I was an overgiver as so many of our medical professionals are. We give, give, give to everybody and until we basically fall down and, and can't stand up anymore. We, we don't save anything for ourselves. We feel guilty saving anything for ourselves because we live to be in service to other people. We put everyone else's priorities ahead of our own. And it just, that, that is probably the fastest way to, to reach that, that pit of despair burnout that, that I got to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very common experience, not just for medical professionals, but for anybody who really is a giving generous person who thinks of themselves last. Yeah. So how did you manage to discover what your needs were and to cut back on overgiving? <laughs> not easy, I know. <laughs> my yeah, my body did not give me a cho- give me a choice. I I I worked in the ER for 24 of my 33 years in veterinary medicine, which is all by itself super high stress and because the shifts start at 15 hours and very often they got to 20 or even 24 hours. I I was getting maybe 3 hours of sleep a day and I did this for 24 years. And I had terrible eating habits because, you know, rushing around, you're going to just shove whatever in your face. You can do the fastest because you're doing 50 things at once. I did this for such a long time. And I I was telling myself a story about how, oh, I'm the superhero who doesn't need to rest. I don't need to take Mm. care of myself. You know, I'll I'll rest when I'm dead. This was a thing that I was proud of saying. Right. Goodness. And it just got to the point where my my body was saying enough was enough. I, I couldn't keep my car in a straight line on the road anymore. Mm. I was I, the thing that probably scared me and, and really brought me to this decision. Like enough is enough. I got to stop doing this was after a really stressful, probably a 20, 20 hour long shift. I was outside on the sidewalk in the broad daylight, 
talking to somebody and I blacked out just for a microsecond, but I literally fell asleep standing up while I was talking to this person. Oh, and goodness. I was like, Oh my God, I, I got to stop doing this or I'm going to die. I'm not going to live to be an old person. And I, I think the reason that I probably stayed in the ER as long as I did is just because I, I really didn't know what else I wanted to do with my life. And that I, I felt good being needed. I mm-hmm. felt, you know, you're, you're constantly, you're the superhero, you know, when you, when you're the vet in the ER, you're it, you know, you're the one that's responsible for, for helping all these pets, for, for making all these clients feel better. All of the staff are looking to you for leadership and inspiration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it feels good feeling like, you know, I've made such a big difference in the lives of these animals and these people, but nobody can do that forever with, especially with neglecting their own self-care. And I thought I could do it. When you're in your 20s, you can pretty much do anything, but yeah, uh, my 20s number, <laughs> it's just not working out anymore. So it really, it, I, I had to kind of get to that rock bottom point where I was just in such a crisis. Like I, I, I knew I couldn't do this for much longer, but I had no idea what else to do with myself because I didn't know any other way. Okay. And that's, that's kind of what pushed me into the, um, the coaching, which I think has really in many ways saved my life. It saved mm-hmm. my my professional life. It saved my physical life. It saved my my personal life. It saved everything. I, and nothing about my life looks the same to me today as it did even five years ago. I'm Is so that grateful right? for that. Oh gosh, what a story! I mean, how can anybody expect a human being to function after twenty hours? We need to we need the downtime yeah. i think you what is it 25 minutes uh, you focus you take 5 minutes and then you can focus again for another. isn't that sort of the new new thing so how does anybody Maybe. manage to do that it it was i didn't i mean honestly i've i really have done permanent damage to my brain and my body by doing that to myself for 24 years i oh. i can definitely tell a difference yeah. And um, just my, my ability to remember things. Mm. I used to have a near photographic memory and now like I can watch a movie and the very next day I can't remember how it ended. I feel like my short-term memory has really suffered. And I, honestly, if you look up sleep deprivation in Wikipedia, yeah. I did this just for fun one day. Yes. I, I went down the checklist of all the horrible things that can happen to you from chronic sleep deprivation and I met every single one of them. Oh, and gosh. it just took me realizing like, I can't, I'm the only person taking care of me. I don't have anyone that's going to walk up to my boss and say, no, 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 don't ask Natalie for anything else anymore. This is, this is enough. She needs to take time for herself. That's my job. And I wasn't yeah. doing my job. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, I realized there sleep deprivation is a form of torture in some third world countries. And I'm doing this to myself voluntarily. Yes. Uh, why do I love myself so little that I'm willing to do this until I literally fall over dead? For people who maybe they appreciate it in the moment, but they're certainly not going to be there taking care of me when I have a stroke or when I'm disabled and I need someone to take care of me. I've I've given away everything that I have and I I just I I can't allow that to happen to me. Yeah. So it was that moment when you realized that you'd fallen asleep during a conversation that -hmm. things needed to change. Was that your sort of aha moment? Yes, it definitely was. And it also felt like an admission of failure because I had defined Mm -hmm. myself for so many years, 24 years at that point, by being the superhero who didn't need to rest and could do 10 things Mm -hmm. at once and had no no limitations. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't true. Oh, gosh. Well, what you raise there is, well, a number of points. As humans, normally, we like to feel we're needed. But then there's certain percentage of us who take that a little too far and we give and give and give. Yeah, you're (laughs) raising your hand. (laughs) Having come out of nursing, I I hear you. Um, But also not knowing what you wanted to do with your life outside the ER, 
your whole identity was tied up there, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So- yeah, that's a key thing. We, you know, we talk about positive intelligence and knowing what our personal saboteurs are. Mm-hmm. My, in my top two, in my top three, I have um, Stickler, which is perfectionist, which is somewhat of an attribute when you work in the medical industry, but can also work to your detriment because mm-hmm. you just can't let you can't let anything be B plus. You have to do A plus work all the time, and yeah. that is super exhausting. But my other two are hyperachiever and pleaser. And just as you just said, both of those kind of give me the tendency of really investing all of my concept of my own self-worth in the value of what I'm giving to other people and the value of what I can accomplish to impress other people, whether those be Mm -hmm. um, bosses, clients, you know, whoever it is that I need to impress to do my job. That that has been the definition of my self worth for such a, a long time, and that's all well and good until it comes to the point where where I was like, if I can't do this anymore because my body's falling apart and I'm going to die, all of a sudden now, oh my God, who am I? What am mm-hmm. I going to do? What what value do I have to contribute? How am I going to make a living? And yes. that's it. Like I said, it, it it just felt like such a crushing failure on mm. on my own. Um, you know, my, my own value to the world and, and also my perception of my value to myself. I felt worthless. I felt like I had failed. I felt like I was never going to be of any use to anyone ever again. And it mm-hmm. was, it was a really miserable place to be. And it's, it's really sad that I had to get to that point before I started doing some really intensive work on myself to, um, to realize that my worth comes from my personal my personal strengths and my, my values and the qualities that can never be taken away from me. Mm -hmm. So that if I can't practice veterinary medicine tomorrow, I get in a car accident or whatever, I can take those strengths and those values and those qualities to do anything. They cannot Mm -hmm. be taken away from me. And so my self-worth is, is intact. It doesn't depend on the situation around me remaining as it is. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like it took a little time for you to discover what your self worth. Oh, totally. Was. Oh, yeah. I yeah, mean, I, I didn't even start doing this work until what I'm 57 now. Yeah. So I was like 53, 54 years old before I started really doing this invested work on myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not one of these things that you can go, okay, I need a new <laughs> dose of self-worth. Where can I find it? <laughs> no, because, you know, whatever your concept of your own self-worth is, you've been practicing that every day of your life for however many years you've been alive. And it's not going to change in a week. You exactly. really, you, it, it's a slow progression. And, and yeah. our judgment of ourselves, gosh, I've been doing this for two months. Why, why am I not any better at this? Mm-hmm. Well, I've been doing it the other way for 55, 56 years. And, and now I'm down on myself for not getting it right after two months. And now I'm going to be like, oh, well, it's it's useless. I can't change. And then I give up. And I've really cheated myself when I do that. Yeah. 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 I'm going into this because to me, the wearing the badge of I'm the super person, I'm the super woman, or even the badge of, oh, I can exist on three or four hours sleep. You hear that so often in our culture, and it's almost a proud moment that Mm -hmm. I don't need it. But the points that you've raised, Natalie, is it is sleep deprivation. The brain needs us to sleep because that's when it flushes out all the toxins, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's how we encode memories. That's how we we um, heal whatever damage has been done to our body through the course of the day. It's mm-hmm. how we maintain our immune system. It's how we fight off cancer cells that are popping up in our body all the time. And when you're when you're sleep deprived, you're in a constant state of immune suppression. Mm-hmm. And that's there's a, a, a much higher rate of cancer with people who work night shift and mm-hmm. also heart attacks and strokes for that exact same reason, because your body's impaired and it can't repair itself anymore. And this was really illustrated clearly to me the first time I caught a cold after I had switched to day shift for the previous 24 years while I was working nights. 
anytime I caught just a regular old cold, I was sick for three weeks and I just thought that was normal. I just lived with it. And a couple Mm -hmm. of months after I switched to a day shift where I was, I was only working eight hours instead of 20. And Mm -hmm. I was actually getting a decent amount of sleep every night. I caught a cold. I was better in three days. I was like, Oh my God, is this normal? (laughs) I'm like, how have I been doing this to myself for so long? (laughs) (laughs) Oh goodness. (laughs) Now I'm glad that you were able to turn it around and that when you caught a cold, it just lasted for three days and not three weeks because just being sick for that length of time, uh, were you dragging yourself to work every day? Well, Mm -hmm. sort of sick. Yeah. Yeah. And again, as you said earlier, it was like a point of pride for me. My, my mantra was I can out suffer my circumstances. My my ability to endure prolonged suffering was something that I was proud of. And yeah. I just, you know, looking at it now, I'm like, why didn't I just make it so that I didn't have to suffer? Mm-hmm. You know, light bulb moment. <laughs> exactly. Ding, ding. So for <laughs> anybody listening that's in their early, early years, 20s, 30s, 40s even, You can do it. The body is amazing. But as Natalie was saying, it's going to tell in your later years. And do you want to go into your later years um, vibrant and alive? Or are you looking forward to that retirement home, which it sounds like you were potentially a candidate for at that that time? You know, I have to say all these years, probably my number one fear is uh, developing Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia Mm -hmm. Um, because my ability to take care of myself and my, my ability to maintain my mental faculties, my intelligence has always been the thing that I'm most proud of losing that, losing my independence, my ability to take care of myself. That is terrifying to me. And yet the lifestyle I was living for all those years, 24 years in the ER, it, it was almost a guarantee that I was going to create my worst case scenario for myself. Oh my goodness. Bring what the, the very thing that you were dreading, you were mm-hmm. actually bringing it closer to yes. you by the sounds of it. Natalie. Yeah. Is this normal for veterinary physicians? I think it is because we we get tunnel vision. We're so we're so overworked and overwhelmed and stressed out. All we can think about is the obstacle that's right in front of us and how mm. we're going to get past that and how we're going to survive it. And we don't always have the capacity to think, what am I doing to myself? What what's my life going to look like 20, 30 years from now if I keep up what I'm doing to myself today? Mm. It's just like, and this, I was guilty of this myself for 30 years. Oh, I'll think about it later. There's, there's always tomorrow. And I woke up one day and I was in my fifties. I'm like, I'm running out of tomorrows to, to actually take charge of my own life and Mm -hmm. make it into what I want. Mm -hmm. If I want to enjoy the life I envisioned for myself in my retirement, which is living in an RV, going from one national park to the next, just being out in nature and hiking and enjoying the wildlife. I can't do that if I'm on life support or half my body is paralyzed because I've had a stroke or I have had a heart attack and I, you know, tied to just daily doctor's visits, you know, and I saw this happen to my dad after he got diagnosed with cancer. Mm. They said, uh, you know, once he was diagnosed, they said he probably had two to three years to live and it it wasn't two or three good years. It was two or three years of do- go to the doctor's office every day or every other day, yeah. constant treatments, constantly being sick and miserable. It, it wasn't quality of life. Mm-hmm. So that's just another example of, you know, things that I, I want to do everything in my power to make sure that whatever time I have left on this earth, I'm going to be able to enjoy it. And I'm going to be able to take care of myself and not have to depend on other people yeah. for that that you're going to be thriving. So you actually had a a case right in front of you, didn't you, with your dad, seeing how you you didn't uh, want to live the rest of your lives. Is there anything being done, Natalie, in the governing body to sort of limit the hours that vets work? Not that I'm aware of. No. Uh, The Veterinary Mental Health Initiative is 
is in its infancy. It's only just now starting to become something that people are even aware of. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm sorry to say that we are, as a, as a profession, we are so far behind the times. I think our, our human medical professionals have had access to mental wellness services and uh, they've, they've had a little bit more support, not that they're not stressed out and overworked as well, but you know, veterinary medicine is, it's just, it's a tough place to be. It's always been a tough place to be. And we also, because we are such genuine giving, caring people, we just have this propensity to to just give away everything that we have and to delay or, or just put off having to think about how we're going to take care of ourselves. Cause there's always tomorrow. And then mm-hmm. something happens, yeah. you have a heart attack, you have a stroke, you get in a car accident and your future all of a sudden is not what you thought it was going to be. So mm-hmm. I, I can't say enough how important it is to not put off the dreams that you have for yourself and for your life. Don't put those off for someday. Yeah. You really want to make sure that you're enjoying your life as much as you, as you possibly can on a daily basis, because none yeah. of us knows if we're going to have tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Being a vet, though. To go into that profession, you have to have a profound love for animals. And not being able to save an animal, you've had that an an enviable position where you euthanize them. I mean, it's just starting to come into the medical profession, Mm -hmm. the dilemma of do no harm, and all of a sudden this person is asking for you to euthanize we have it here in canada with maid it's a whole other moral dilemma i would imagine when you've had to euthanize a, an animal is there support systems within the practice do you get to talk to another person to sort of share what your feelings are or is it just Done. It, de- and that's it depends it. on the practice, really. Some some places will have those types of services or they will have access to uh, like a pet loss support group. Um, locally, we have, I, I believe they meet every month. There's a, a pet loss bereavement group where people can okay. just get together either, either virtually or in person and just get support from other people and from counselors. Um, some clinics, I think, also have a person like a designated person in the hospital Mm-hmm. Who can be available to talk to pet owners who've lost their pet. And also for the staff too, because we get very emotionally involved, especially if this is a pet that's been coming to our hospital for its whole life. And now yes. all of a sudden, you know, we, we've been seeing them through all the stages of their life. And now it's time to say goodbye. That, that hits us very hard too. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned that because before we came uh, onto the, the show, we were talking about, uh, I was surprised to hear the high rates of um, suicide in the profession. Mm-hmm. Is it because you <laughs> compassion overload? Is it because you love and want to save the pets that you feel a failure if you can't? What is going on there? Apart, obvious, the stress and the burnout that they're experiencing yeah. due to the hours, eh? I think that there's probably a lot that goes into that. Um, A huge part of that is the complete lack of any kind of work-life balance. Um, Mm. We are just expected to be available 24-7 nights, weekends, holidays. Everybody wants to be able to have access to you. I personally, I've been dragged out of the bathroom. I have been dragged out of my car as I've been driving home at the end of the day. My phone goes off 24-7, middle of the weekend, holidays doesn't matter. People are constantly reaching out, wanting advice, wanting to send me pictures of some cut or scrape on their pet. So it's like, I have to be available to everybody. Uh, It cuts into your family time. It cuts into any kind of personal, uh, personal things that you value. I'm, I'm constantly missing out on things that I was looking forward to in my life because I got stuck at work late and it's just this constant building frustration. So the, mm-hmm. there's also, I think, I think a lot of professions experience this, but most of the time when you get feedback from your clients, it's going to be negative because when people are happy, they don't tell you. 
They only mm-hmm. tell you when they're unhappy. So okay. you get the people that are complaining, why is this so expensive? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, why, why are you going on vacation now? My dog was just diagnosed with this disease. It's going to need treatment or need surgery. It's, you know, you can't have a vacation. You can't have a personal life. Um, there is a huge financial component because most veterinary students are graduating school these days with anywhere from uh, a quarter million to sometimes like $350,000 worth of debt. And Gosh. that you're never, I mean, the salaries just don't support being able to pay that off. Mm-hmm. Veterinary medicine is not a well-paid profession. Okay. And so you are trapped under this mountain of student loan debt that you can never escape. And I've, I've talked to some friends of mine that are telling me they're paying well over $3,000 a month, just in student loans, more than their mortgage. And for 30 years, you know, these, these, these people are getting close to their retirement age and they're still paying off their student loans. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you, so you add this, this financial pressure, this complete lack of work-life balance, your, your family's always resenting you because you're never around because you're always at work or you're always answering the phone for somebody, but you're never there for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this, this negative feedback, these, these expectations that you're going to just be available 24 seven. And, you know, there's all kinds of other reasons, but people, they, they, they get to a point of desperation where they, they just don't see another way out. Um, I, 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 my heart really, really feels for, for people who get to that position and you, you don't always know what's in somebody's, what's in somebody's mind when they make a decision like that, but it it doesn't have to get to the point where there's, there's, there's services available, you know, there's, there's always, and, and more and more as, as time goes on, there's more and more um, emotional support services available. A lot of Mm -hmm. it is for free. And it's just a matter of there, there's also a stigma that people have to overcome to even reach out, to ask for help because they don't want to look like they are crazy. They don't want to look like they have a mental illness or Mm -hmm. or whatever the story is they're telling themselves. So they feel like they have to suffer in silence. I should be able to figure this out for myself is probably one of the worst things we can say to ourselves Okay, because none of us can, none of us can do it all. We cannot Mm -hmm save the world by ourselves. We can't, sometimes we can't save ourselves without help. And there's no shame in that. Yeah, for sure. So it sounds like there's a boundary issue being able to say no, because our doctors, I certainly couldn't pick up my phone and say, I've got this boo-boo on my knee. Can you fix it? (laughs) Uh, I couldn't even reach my doctor. Exactly. Why, why aren't you protected in that same way? I wish I could tell you. I can't even tell you how many hours I spend on a daily basis talking to people on the phone, answering their questions, going over lab results, you know, doing all these things that have to take place after hours. Because mm. during, during the regular business hours, I'm in surgery, I'm seeing appointments, I'm doing things that are work-related. And I finally drag myself back to my desk at six o'clock and there's a giant stack of papers and phone call requests and, and all kinds of notes that I have to take care of. It is, it is so demoralizing. And you're yeah. absolutely right. I could never call my doctor's office and say, hey, I have a quick question. They would be <laughs> like, well, you need to schedule an appointment and come in because they're, they're not going to waste their time with that. But, but you know, it's, I think it's 50-50. There's a client expectation that their vet cares enough that they're going to call and talk to them and they shouldn't have to come in and have another office visit. But there's Mm. also this expectation from our end that we, we care so much that this is, this is what we're here for. And we put that expectation on ourselves as well. Okay. So it's a a double, double double-edged sword. that sounds like that Mm. you're walking. So if anybody has got a pet, take a box of chocolates, take (laughs) some flowers have kindness for your vet because you just don't know what they're living with. And exactly. it's it, the the picture you just painted, uh, what popped into my mind is why do people go into veterinary medicine? Exactly. You're 100% on the money. We go into it because we have such a burning passion to help animals. Mm-hmm. And for so many of us, as soon as we graduate and go into practice, it slowly gets squeezed out of us and replaced by burnout, stress, 
frustration, mm-hmm. resentment, and, mm-hmm. and eventually giving up. Yeah. And there are a record number of veterinarians just leaving the profession, which is putting even more stress on the people who are there to pick up. There's, there's increased um, caseload. Some, some hospitals I've heard even have like a, a two or three month waiting list to even get an appointment mm-hmm. because wow. there's so there's so many clients out there who can't find help. There's the, with the vets that are leaving, the ones that are behind actually have to do more work to, mm-hmm. to make up the difference. So it's, it doesn't appear at the moment to be getting any better. You're just losing more vets because they just yeah. cannot tolerate the stress on their bodies. That's unfortunately true. Okay. What a picture. All right. We're glad that you're here to share that with us. And I think it's creating awareness with others to sort of see your life. Um, We sort of take it for granted when we go in with our pet. Yeah, that you have a life as well. So please be kind to your vet. We need them. We don't want them to be leaving. Yes. Exactly. And this is what I tell people when I'm, when I'm coaching people for stress and burnout, they, there's this superhero complex, you know, it feels like a failure to say, I can't do this, or I can't work seven days a week, or I can't stay for 12 hours today. And Mm -hmm. we really have to safeguard ourselves because if I want to be in this profession for 30 or 40 years or for however long, if, if there's so many people and so many pets out there that need me so badly, it is my responsibility to make sure that I can be, that I can be here doing what I'm doing for all these years and decades to come, which means mm-hmm. I have to take care of myself. If I never change the oil in my car or maintain the car engine, I just kept driving it and driving it. Eventually it's going to fall apart. And that is exactly what happens to our minds and our bodies. If we don't That's, stop to replenish ourselves. Yeah. And yeah, it's we absolutely need to feel guilty about that's the thing. We are such givers. We feel guilty about mm. taking time for ourselves and about saying no when some yet another person wants one more thing for me before I leave that day. And it's already eight o'clock and uh, it just it, it has to come down to enough is enough. Exactly. You mentioned I'm going to leave the veterinary world and you mentioned that you're now a coach you are a, a positive intelligence certified mastery coach. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. Oh, thanks. It's so, been life changing for me. Has it? Tell the uh, listeners I'm attempting to bring a positive intelligence into my talks, into my own coaching. Can you share with them what is positive intelligence that we're banging on about here? Oh, my gosh. That is the million dollar question. I have gone back and forth with myself about how to describe it for people that ask me that question in less than 20 minutes, because there's so much to it. There's just not, it's not just one thing. And I, you know, I I came down to like, really, this is what, what I would say. This is the owner's manual for the human mind that you always wish that you had. If you've ever wondered why do I act this way when, when this set of circumstances happens? Why, why did she act this way towards me? Why, why do I get so stressed out in this circumstance when somebody else may not? I have learned so much about why I do the things I do and why other people do the things that they do that it, it's, it's been so not only just educational, but it has also empowered me to take charge of my own stress. Because when I understand when my coworker comes at me with all this, this frantic negative energy. I understand why, because I, now I know what she's stressed out about. I know it's not about me. I'm mm-hmm. just the person that happened to be standing in front of her. So I have a lot more empathy for other people's bad behavior or, or triggering behavior. So I'm less triggered by it. And my own resilience and my own ability to, to not let stress affect me so much. So here's, so here's an example. Anytime I had a super stressful, like just a really, really soul wrenching day at the, at the clinic, sometimes I would come home, I would be so devastated. I would, I would be exhausted. I would be frustrated. I would be angry, upset, all the things it would take me 
very often 48 hours or even longer to recover emotionally, psychologically mm -hmm. to where I felt like I could finally go back without having a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. Because of positive intelligence, I have been able to get that down to 20 minutes from 48 hours down to 20 minutes. That is literally 1% of the time that it used to take me to recover. So it's not that I never get stressed out or I never get upset or angry anymore, but when it does happen, I get 40, 47 and a half hours of my life back to actually be calm and peaceful and enjoy what I'm doing and be productive and be the kind of person that other people enjoy spending time with instead of this miserable ball of stress and tension that's just like growling and lashing out at people because I want to be left alone because I'm so traumatized. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really just I can never expect myself to never get angry or upset. That's that's just that's being a human. Things are going to happen. You're going to have feelings about it, but you don't have to marinate in those feelings at the bottom of that pit of despair for days or hours or, or however long you, there's a way to recover your, your inner peace. Mm -hmm. And that alone has given me so much of my own quality of life back. It, my yeah. relationships have gotten better. My stress level has gone way down. I am so much happier than I ever was before. My, my feeling of general life satisfaction and my optimism for the future are exponentially higher than they've ever been before. I just, I can't tell you enough about how much and in how many ways my life has changed as a result of this work. Yeah. Can't say enough about it. What led you to positive intelligence? What was it about positive intelligence? What instead was it? of EQ? <laughs> emotional it was intelligence. FOMO yeah. is what it was. Oh, I, was it? <laughs> I graduated from my coach training program and a lot of my, um, my uh, classmates were talking about, oh, we're going to go do positive intelligence. So I'm like, well, what is that? So I went and checked it out and I was reading all the stuff on their website. And I was like, this is crap. This is not real. They're hyping this up. This can't be true. Because I think part of that is because I, I had just signed up for a, a, a fairly expensive program that came with a lot of lofty promises and just completely under delivered. And the, um, the whole experience was so negative. I think I was like extra vigilant about not falling for that again. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I ain't doing that. That's that. You go ahead, have fun. But they kept talking about it and talking about it. And like the level of excitement just kept climbing. And I finally got to this point where like, what am I going to like, if I don't do it, I'm going to regret this. Right. And so let me just do it and prove that it really was just a bunch of hype. Right. Oh, I'm going to yeah. show you, I'm going to sign up for this program. It's not going to do anything for me. And then I'm going to go like, ha ha, I told you so. So I sign up for this program. And I think I probably like actively resisted the process for probably the first three weeks out of the seven weeks. And then one day, I don't know, I don't know what it was that I heard in particular, but the light bulbs just started popping off in my brain. And I was like, Oh my God, that is, that's exactly what's wrong with me. That's exactly why I do this. This is exactly why I feel so angry when I see that. And, and once my armor came down, the, the, the light bulb moments were just like dominoes after that. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I got to the end of the program, I was like, number one, I felt like I, I was down on myself because I had wasted like the first three weeks of the process resisting it so much, but <laughs> more than anything, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is the answer to everything. I want more. And that was by that time I had just drunk the Kool-Aid and I was like, sign me up. I'm joining this program. <laughs> <laughs> You're drawing him. Yeah. Well, I've regretted it since. <laughs> so it sounds like you were initiated into the seven week program, which is where you learn all about positive intelligence. What's a saboteur? What is your sage? And how do you magically change your mindset from being super stressed in? 20 hours, you would continue in that mode to sort of 20 minutes. What was it in those that initial days that sort of had you go, okay, they're onto something here? Part of it. So we learn an exercise called uh, a PQ rep, which builds the ability of self-command. Self-command is the, your ability to control your brain activation whether your brain is in stress survival mode 
or whether your brain is in peaceful, focused action, um, clear headed action mode. So we practice this exercise for, you know, maybe two minutes at a time, several minutes a day. And so I was doing this going, oh, this is never going to work. So part of, you know, one of the things that we do is like rub your two fingertips together with such attention that you can feel the fingertip ridges rubbing together. And I was like, this is stupid. This is never going to work, but okay, I'm going to do it so I can check the box and say that I did it. And I was doing this for, you know, several weeks and just practicing calming down, focusing on the fingertip ridges. And then one day I saw something on one of the message boards that we use for work. And I can't even remember what it was, but it irritated the hell out of me. I I read this and I was like, what the heck is going on? What's wrong with these people? I like, I'm here comes my blood pressure. I'm getting all tense. I'm like, and I'm like, okay, I did this for literally three seconds. And immediately I felt a wave of calm just wash over my body. My heart rate dropped everything. My body relaxed, my tension disappeared. And I was like, Oh my God, I've, I've created like a, an association between doing this simple little action and putting my brain and my body into a state of calm. And yeah. because I had practiced it so many times, regardless of whether I thought it was going to work or not, that that response of calming and focusing just got quicker and and shorter and more effective so that in the moment when i needed it it was there instantly and it the the change was incredible and i could i couldn't think of any more convincing evidence that this stuff really works and that's just mm-hmm. one little piece of the program yeah well, for the listeners natalie was rubbing her uh, index finger and her thumb together and the just focusing on, as she said, the fingertip ridges, it just the mere fact that you're focusing on it, it kind of takes you into a different part of the brain. And you're no longer thinking about your stress. And it's almost as if you're giving your body and your brain a mental break just by focusing on that simple simple exercise and I believe they use all the senses don't they so there's yes. touch there's hearing yep even taste when you know you take the first bite of whatever you're going to eat oh, for your meal yes yeah focusing on the sensations of the of the food the emotional response the the coolness of the first sip of water that you take um, I like to like multiple times I'll probably like, I wash my hands 50 times a day when I'm at work 10 seconds of just noticing the sensation of the cold water on my hands. And it's like a pressure valve. It just releases little bits of stress and pressure all throughout the day so that when I get home, I don't have nearly so much to recover from as I did before I started doing this training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And exactly like you said, it was that moment when I realized, oh my God, this really works. I really do feel better. Then doing that exercise it went from just being something I did grudgingly so I could check the box and say that I did it. It went from that to be something that I actually look forward to. And then all of a sudden I was looking for what some other ways that I could build this into my day and, and how else can I, can I give myself more of this? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually the seven weeks you get an app it's downloaded on your phones. It's even, you can download it onto your computer, whatever is easy. And it's just a, a daily practice. And it goes for about seven weeks because I, I, I think they figured it out. This is very well documented, well researched. People have spent thousands of hours in MRIs machines looking at one part of the brain versus the positive part and all the anyway so this is an app that you get and you practice it but as Natalie was saying you can actually increase those moments of uh, relaxation by focusing on washing your hands just hearing the water when you're in the shower feeling the warm water And it's just bringing your brain back. I like to think of it as bringing it back to neutral so that you're not thinking about all the things you've got to do when you get out of the the shower, all the things that are waiting for you. It's almost 
like a moment of, as you said, calmness, just just for those moments. And it makes so much difference. Absolutely. You know, the thing that was also like one of my more recent light bulb moments, the, the creator of the program, his name is Shirzad Shamin. He was talking about how how we can access the part of our brain that brings us insight, like those flashes of insight, that that deep inner wisdom. And he, the, this is the way he phrased it. it. Have you ever been in the shower and just out of the blue, you get struck by this incredible idea that solves a problem that you've been wrestling with or just helps you see something in a new way? And the reason that that happens is because when you're in the shower, more of your brain is attuned to that strong stimulus of that hot water hitting your skin, the steam, the sounds of the water going down the drain. It's a it's a more compelling physical stimulus that takes more of your brain's attention. And so that, not, not even on purpose, shifts your brain activation over to away from, from your, your stress, your anxiety, your distraction. That's the survival part of your brain. When you focus on those physical stimulations, you're shifting over to what we call the sage brain that quiets down all those distracting voices about what's happening later at work today. What am I going to make for dinner tonight? What did so-and-so say to me yesterday? All of that kind of comes down a few levels. And now all of a sudden you can hear that whisper of intuition that was being drowned out before. And I just thought that was genius because like the shower is probably one of the places where I get my, my best ideas. And now I know why. And not only now do I know how it works, now I know how I can do it on purpose when I need it instead of just yes. hoping it's going to hit me out of the blue by itself. Yeah, or waiting for the weekend or waiting for your holiday once a year to roll around. It's almost as mm -hmm. if you're taking your brain on a break. Yes. Uh, for it's What is it, 12, 15 minutes a day yep. when you get onto the yep. app? A mental vacation. Yeah. So that's it. That was what helped you start to look and be kinder to yourself to sort of take care of your needs versus spreading yourself so thin by the sounds of it. Yeah, I think I think the exercise is what helped me calm down so that I could actually receive the the teaching part of the program without resisting it. Like I said before, I was I was telling myself a story about how this is all hype. It's never going to work. And so as I started to tone down that heavy judgment, my I'm, I'm a very judgmental of myself, but I'm also very critical of things that, uh, that I'm telling myself I should be suspicious of. Once I was able to reduce my, my level of judgment, then the, my, I think my mind was more receptive to actually learning what the program mm -hmm. is teaching me. And then I started realizing all the applications, like not just the way they're teaching it, but this is how it can apply to my relationship with my mother. This is how I can use this when I go to work tomorrow. This is how I can use this when my car breaks down in the middle of the road. And now I'm stressed out because I'm going to be late for something. And there's just no part of your life that is not made better by the, the knowledge and the skill that you gain from going through this program and from practicing it reliably on a daily basis yeah going back to what you said from seeing that notice at work you could feel that part of you what one of one of your saboteurs do you think that may have been oh gosh so one of the things that that also kind of smacked me in the face as as our founder Shirzad was describing it so we have these nine accomplice saboteurs but we also have what we call the master saboteur the judge and the judge starts all of our emotional hijackings and then the saboteurs come sweeping in to say oh i have a solution so the judge definitely i, I was instantly judging them for their inconsiderate or short-sighted behavior. But immediately after my judge jumped up and said, that's not fair, my victim came swooping in to say, this is specifically not fair to me. How could they do this to me? And don't they understand what I had to do to be ready for this? And now they're changing it. And it was all about me. And I, it was only after I was able to calm myself down with, uh, with this uh, little finger rubbing exercise that I could finally see that's exactly what was happening. And 
now I'm able to shift to a calmer way, a more effective way of managing. Because, you know, if you if you have a conflict with someone or you need to have a conversation with somebody, if you come at them with all that judgment and resentment and frustration, they're going to back up and they're they're going to put up their armor and they're or they're going to push back at you and nothing productive is going to happen. Everybody's in self-protection mode. Everybody's worried about being right and you being wrong and and nothing good happens when people are in that hijack mode. So if you want anything about your personal dynamic with someone else or your situation, if you want that to change in any way, you have to approach it from a calm, focused state of mind, or you're going to get nothing but pushback and resistance. Yeah. And that's exactly how I was living my life for, for 50 plus years before that. Lots of conflict. Natalie, thank you for taking that and going further. That's exactly where I was going with it, because that just shows you for anybody that's married, for you married people out there, if you are having the same argument with your spouse, chances are you're in that judgment or one of your other saboteurs is right behind and you go in and that's exactly the energy that you are bringing to your partner. Person may have been in a perfectly good mood, but they're sensing where you're coming from. And as Natalie said, their armor <laughs> is out. They're in self-protection mm. mode. So instead of two loving people coming to discuss, you've now got all the judgment and the rest of the saboteur gang out in force. Mystery solved. Yeah. That's where all your arguments are coming Absolutely. from. Absolutely. You know, the, the saboteur <laughs> mindset, saboteurs are not interested in working together. They're not interested in finding a resolution. They're interested in protecting themselves and being right. And as long as we're in saboteur mode, that's, that's the only thing that's going to happen. Yeah. Natalie, this has been an amazing uh, mm -hmm. conversation. And as you can both hear it in our voice, we are both positive intelligence people. And this is something we firmly believe in. And Natalie, I understand you run courses, you take people through the seven week course. Mm -hmm. Do you have one coming up? Absolutely. So I can I, I can do uh, what we call pods or small groups of people, but I also have taken clients through one to one, just them and me. And it is such a personalized experience. There, there's such deep self development work that happens when I'm able to focus the entire session just on one person. Um, mm -hmm. Not that one's worse or, or or better or worse than the other. It's just you know some people prefer the group experience and some people really want to work on one thing about their life. You know yeah. whether it's their relationship with their child or their relationship with their spouse or their their upcoming career decision. When you spend seven weeks of this just incredible, mind-blowing self-development and, and it's all focused on one goal of yours, there's no way that you're not going to see incredible progress by the, by the end of the program. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I do. I do the solo experience. I do the group experience. And I also do monthly workshops, which you don't necessarily have had to have been through the seven week program to be able to participate in it. I try to make it understandable, even for people who have not been through the positive intelligence program, but okay. it's, it's learning how to apply these skills to a, a daily challenge that we face, whether it's uh, uh, you know a, a relationship issue that you have at home or at work, whether it's your own feeling of being your worst critic. Um, mm -hmm. I had a workshop recently on dealing with difficult people, um, how to create and strengthen your relationships, how to create better relationships, stress management. There's so many facets of our lives that we find challenging or frustrating or that we just we want to avoid because they're unpleasant. And it's really amazing how just the, the tools that we learn in seven weeks can be applied to almost everything that happens in our lives to make it better. And so if you, um, if your listeners are interested, there's a whole section of my website that is focused on these workshops. It's um, no limits, coaching workshops. 
And um, so I'll have the workshop of the month up there. You can sign up and I'd love to see you there. And meet Natalie and and hear more. I will make sure all that, uh, how people can get hold of you is in the show notes. Thank you. Natalie, are you still working as a vet? I am. I'm working two days a week doing surgery only, which is my happy place. And uh, it's just, it's the right, for me, it just, it was the right balance of still doing what I love in the way that I love to do it and still having plenty of time left over for my personal life and for the coaching business. Mm -hmm. And you can attribute that. Do you, I'm sure you're bringing in the skills that you've learned in positive intelligence. Absolutely. And I realized uh, very recently that I am, as far as I know, I'm the only person in the country who is both a doctor of veterinary medicine and a certified positive intelligence coach. So that's the uniqueness that I can bring to my stress and burnout program, because there's no better way to, to start addressing that, that level of stress than to learn how to not even get stressed out in the first place, which is really a huge component of positive intelligence. Our response to whatever it is that's happening around us in the moment is so much of what contributes to our own stress, but we're so wrapped up in it that we don't actually see it. And so this, I can't imagine a better foundation for a stress program than positive intelligence. Yeah, it is. So if anybody is in that situation, uh, you can get hold of Natalie or I have just become a certified positive intelligence coach. (laughs) Celebrated. Thank you. Celebrated that just this week. So if anybody's interested in hearing the grief component, there's a number of episodes already up uh, on the podcast. Natalie, I want to thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you for having me. It's been great to be here. (laughs) Thank you again. Well, that's it. That's a wrap, as I like to say. Until next time, listeners, I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>